Nai Lot, and I'm a graduate student in Dr. Sishu Chen's lab. Got about four years of experience doing various forms of untargeted mass spectrometry for metabolomics, so hopefully I'll be able to make this video useful. This recording will start with some of the fundamentals of untargeted mass spectrometry, including tandem mass spec designs and chromatography, plus some information about experimental design and limitations. I'll then give a detailed tutorial of the untargeted metabolomics workflow for our latest mass spectrometer, the Timstoff Flex, and that'll include instrument setup and calibration, sample queuing, as well as just running the mass spectrometer. I'll then conclude the video with a demonstration of the data analysis software Metaboscape, along with some of the fundamentals of untargeted data analysis. Please send questions in the chat. I can pause between sections, and then we'll also have a longer time period at the end for more questions. Untargeted mass spectrometry is a methodology where the researcher doesn't know which specific ions they are looking for in advance, though often they will have a general idea of the class of small molecules they are interested in, and that could be sugars, hormones, amino acids, peptides, or any other secondary metabolites. It's this lack of specificity that makes untargeted mass spec a great hypothesis generation and data discovery tool. To really make sense of this though, I think it helps to give a definition of targeted mass spectrometry. This will be covered by my colleague Schweda in another video, but in summary, targeted MS is a technique that uses tandem mass spectrometry, that is, multiple stages of mass filters and analyzers, usually as a form of triple quadrupole. Which specific compounds are able to be detected is predetermined by the researcher, who must run them individually in advance. Without doing this, the instrument and its software will not know which ions to target. This means that there is a highly manual process in setting up a targeted mass spectrometer, but that comes with the benefit of simple data analysis, good sensitivity in complex samples, and ease of quantification. Untargeted mass spectrometry, then, is the array of methodologies that do not have pre-selection and filtering of specific ions. The researcher does not know how to have to know the identity of a given compound to detect it. It is worth noting that the workflows of targeted versus untargeted mass spec that I've just given you are applicable for proteomics, lipidomics, or metabolomics. The terminology is different between these fields, but the principles are the same. Planning a successful untargeted metabolomics experiment involves thinking about a lot of related processes. A lot of this is going to be a review from Dr. Chen's last talk, but I'd like to provide a quick summary. So if you're interested in volatiles or compounds that can be derivatized into volatiles, a gas chromatography system can be great. These provide good, very reliable separation to the extent that simple M over Z data and retention time is often enough to identify a peak. Usually though, if the researcher cannot volatilize their sample, they must consider liquid chromatography. This is a very broadly applicable methodology that makes a tandem mass spectrometer essential. Quickly, I'd like to cover liquid chromatography. High and ultra-high pressure liquid chromatographers work by using two solvents, usually water and an organic solvent, to push a dissolved sample through a column. This gradually changing ratio of water to organic solvent, along with the column chemistry, affects how long a compound will stick to the column. This process provides compound separation into peaks that can then be detected by the mass spectrometer, and this forms the backbone of most mass spec applications. Column chemistry is outside the scope of this lecture, but know that columns vary by length, diameter, and pore size. They can also vary by the substrate within them that forms the stationary phase. Reverse phase and hillock columns are the most common in metabolomics, and these are essentially opposites. Reverse phase columns are hydrophobic and better at retaining less polar compounds. The gradient must become more organic to force those less polar compounds to elute. Hillock columns, then, are the reverse of all of these parameters. Tandem systems combine multiple mass filters and detectors with an ion fragmentation system to break up precursor ions, or MS1, into fragment ions called MS2 
and then can sometimes cause further fragmentation into MSN. Some cutting-edge tandem mass spectrometers also have trapped ion mobility systems, which can add further resolution and can sometimes give another useful layer of identification, that is the collision cross-section or CCS. The Timstoff flex, which is diagrammed here, contains that TIM cell. I like to think of these three or sometimes four data points, that is the retention time, MS1, MSMS, and CCS, as fingerprints. They enable the identification of compounds from a complex mixture, assuming that the researcher has the correct data analysis tools. There are of course trade-offs to be made with any tandem MS design. An instrument's duty cycle is pretty important, with higher duty cycles being able to capture more peaks from a constantly eluting LC. Sensitivity, resolution, and fragmentation are also very much worth considering. For example, the Timstoff diagrammed here again generally only fragments ions once, so it's not useful for higher MSN fragmentation. Now I would like to talk about the limitations of untargeted metabolomics, particularly LCMS, since GCMS is generally more straightforward. Of course, the researcher must be able to get the type of ions they are looking for to ionize, they must tune to get a sufficient signal intensity, and they likely need to establish appropriate fragmentation patterns in order to get MSMS data. But in my opinion, these are usually trivial roadblocks in comparison to data analysis. Since the researcher does not run authentic standards to tune the instrument, as in targeted mass spectrometry, there must be another way to compare the fingerprints of resultant peaks with authentic data. And this is usually done by a spectral library. Unfortunately, no LCMS methods are infallible due to the sheer complexity of tandem mass spec data that comes from mixed metabolite samples. Many metabolites have isomeric and isobaric species that give overlapping signals. The chemistry of adduct formation can also make things really difficult. These challenges often make algorithmically identifying a peak impossible. A published example of this that I really like comes from a research group that ran the same experimentally prepared samples through the same LC and column, but on two different mass spectrometers. Despite keeping as many things as possible the same, they only achieved about a 33% peak overlap. The researchers attributed this to inconsistent fragmentation patterns, varying charge states, and adduct formation differences. Peak identification algorithms are constantly improving, as are the spectral libraries for peak annotation. These libraries have a database of fingerprints from authentic standards that can be compared to sample data. Identification failures occur when these data do not sufficiently match. For example, MS1 is usually available but not always sufficient. MSMS is the most valuable data although this can vary by fragmentation technique. Retention time is often useless unless samples are ran on the same column between your authentic standards and your sample data. CCS is really useful if you can get it, but most spectral libraries do not contain any CCS data, as the instruments that can collect it are fairly recent. Because of these limitations, it is important for the researcher to choose the correct chromatography and tandem MS settings that will give them the best chance at good data analysis later on down the road. So these are the principles of mass spectrometry, and I'll now give a demonstration using our latest instrument, the Bruker Timstoff Flex, with an Elute HPLC. Welcome to the University of Florida's ICBR Mass Spectrometry Lab. Um, this is the Timstoff Flex, it's the mass spectrometer by Bruker that I'll be using to show you um, untargeted metabolomics. Uh, I'm just going to demonstrate the routine setup and uh, cleaning, calibration and all that that I do before I start as any mass spectrometry run. So the first thing I need to do is just check uh, that I have enough nitrogen gas for the length of mass spectrometry run that I plan to do. Um, I just do this by kind of seeing how much the tank weighs. 
since unfortunately it's pretty hard to tell using these gauges how much gas is actually in there. And next I just need to check that I have 85 psi on this, this gauge, which I do. That's what the Timstoff needs. So the Timstoff has two sources, one of which is the ESI so source, which I've talked about. That takes input either from the liquid chromatographer or from the direct infusion needle. It also has a MALDI source, which is unfortunately out of the scope of what I'm going to be talking about today. But that lets us do um, imaging with the Timstoff. So if I know the Timstoff hasn't been ran recently, one thing I like to do is to check that the elect electrospray ionization or ESI source is clean. So I do that by just opening this little thing here, swinging it open. Right here we can see the, um, the needle that leads from the LC source, as well as the plate here behind which is the glass capillary. Oftentimes this plate gets kind of dirty, usually from salt buildup. Um, which is bad because this is where the ions are pulled in. In the Timstoff, it's good because the capillary is orthogonal. As you can see, it kind of takes a right angle, um, which helps prevent um, anything dirty from getting actually into the instrument, which is good because this is easy to clean. So I do need to, though, pull off this ESI needle. It's a little bit finicky and just inspect that little needle here under the microscope, which I'll do in a second. Bruker provides this little um, device that lets us view the tip of the needle here. Um, the actual needle tip, which is at the very end here, needs to be a quarter of a millimeter out from the body of the source here. Um, and that's what lets liquid flow with the envelop enveloping gas at exactly the right um, dimensions to get good ionization. So we have this little um, microscope here, which we can put over the tip and look through. Now that I've put the ESI source back together and the needle back in, I can actually start calibrating the Timstoff. So here in this uh, direct infusion syringe, I actually have um, tune mix and sodium formate. And I'll explain in a minute what they do. But this is then ducted directly into the SI needle, as in direct infusion. And I'll go on the computer to explain how I actually do the calibration from there. So here's our Lute HPLC. And just to summarize briefly what the LC does, the auto sampler has a syringe here that pulls a small amount of sample from our vials and then mixes it with a solvent up here. And then these pumps uh, push the sample and the solvent through a column. So once the solvent leaves the column, it can optionally be pushed through this ultraviolet DAD detector, but after that it then goes into the ESI source. In our case we have a switching valve in front of the ESI source, and that lets us either take solvent directly from the LC and put it into the mass spectrometer, or at our discretion and within each sample that is ran, we can inject calibrant as well. Now that the instrument is set up, I can open an appropriate MS method using the OTOF control software. I'll show you the tuning parameters that were set for this method, and also show you the calibration steps. Whenever you get a mass spec, the manufacturer will generally provide you with a default method that works well for a given application, such as small molecules, proteomics, or lipidomics. Here is the positive, TIMS on passive enabled small molecules method that Bruker provided us, with some adaptations that I've made. I'll explain what a few of those terms mean as I go, and now I'll just walk you through some of the tabs in the OTOF control software. Here in this mode tab, the general settings let us turn TIMS on, set calibration segments, as well as a few other things. I'd also like to point out the scan range. The M over Z range is kind of self-explanatory. If anything falls outside of this range, the method will exclude it. The 1 over K naught range is very similar, but based on mobility. Anything outside of this mobility range will also be excluded by the software.
Under the Mode tab and then Tims, we can also set the 1 over K naught range, as well as the ramp time and some other Tims specific settings. These source settings are very important. The nebulizer, dry gas, and dry temperature must all be set appropriately depending on the flow rate set in the LC method, and that gives you the ideal ionization from the ESI source. It's also here that you can change the source type if need be into, say, nano ESI, and we can also turn on or off the syringe pump here as well as control the switching valve settings. This tune tab has a few very important settings for the mass spectrometer that help determine what size of ions are able to pass through it. These settings are more relevant to the mass to charge of which ions can pass through than the actual scan range that I just talked about on the right hand side. These settings are essential to making a method appropriate for small molecules, peptides, lipids, or whatever you're looking for. Usually the manufacturer provides settings that are very close to what you need for a given application, or they at least provide a very good starting point. Similarly, these TIMS tuning settings are critical to helping the correct size of ions pass through the trapped ion mobility cells at the front. Bruker provides these settings for a given application, and in my experience, these do not have to be altered. These MSMS settings allow us to turn passive on or off. I want to take this time to point out the segments in our method here. You can see in segment 1, passive is turned off. In segment 2, passive is also off. This is the calibration segment where the switching valve turns on. Segment 3 is then the sample acquisition segment. It's here that we have passive turned on to fragment ions from the LC. Once a method is open and you're happy with tuning, you can start calibration. Calibration generally needs to be done about once a week for the TOF and daily for the trapped ion mobility cells, but I generally calibrate both before every run. So I've now started the syringe pump to direct infuse my tune mix sodium formate mixture, and you can see I'm zooming into the 622, 922, and 322 ions which are the largest ions you can see right now from the tune mix um, infusion. The rest of these ions are sodium formate. And now I'll go to the calibration tab, select TOF. With HPC mode on, I can then hit calibrate and accept. Now we need to set the source gas flow for the TIM cells appropriately. This is a calibration step that is necessary to do regularly because the gas pressure from the nitrogen tanks can vary slightly. To do this, we set the electron voltage of the 622 calibrant ion, that's from the tune mix, to a standard value of 132. I've, so now I've switched the mobility count settings to electron voltage and adjusted the extracted ion mobilogram to show 622. Currently, 622 is showing something just slightly below an electron voltage of 132, I think right around 128. And so now I can turn this source gas knob clockwise, and you'll see the mobilogram peaks jump right. Once they stabilize, I can calibrate the TIMS cell. The TIMS calibration mode is linear, and the ions are set to ESI tune mix. I can hit calibrate and then usually I need to remove an ion that has a bigger difference from the expected value. Once the software is happy with that and I have a sufficiently good calibration, I can hit accept. I am now happy with the MS method and its calibration, so now I can move on to the acquisition software Highstar. This interfaces with the OTOF control software, as well as the LC components. I'm starting by purging the pumps to remove air, and also doing a seal wash and priming the mobile phase. I need to select the correct column position, depending on which port I attached the column to. And next, I need to do some preliminary auto sampler washes. I usually wash twice with each solvent. Now I'll set up the sample table in Highstar. 
I'll enter the vial positions, and these are labels that are engraved into the auto sampler rack and recognized by the software. I can then enter the sample ID. I'll set a volume of 5 microliters here. The data path I will set to my own folder. I'll call this workshop demo. And now I need to choose an appropriate LC method. Okay, so I've opened the LC method, and now I'm opening the elute pump settings. On the bottom left side of the pump settings, you can see the timetable. Each point on the table has a corresponding time at which you can apply a different flow rate or a different percent A and percent B. We don't change the flow rate here, but we do vary the percent A and B. You can see the visualization of the gradient we set up using the graph on the right. And it is this gradient on our reverse phase column that pushes the more hydrophobic compounds off the column as peaks. Column oven control lets us set a temperature in the column chamber. This temperature control can help maintain consistency between sample runs. Importantly, we also need to check column selection here to ensure that the LC is pushing solvent through the correct port and column. We can also change the auto sampler settings to set injection mode, needle height, temperature the samples are retained at, and how many times the auto sampler needle is washed per injection. So I'm now happy with the separation method, and I just need to select the right mass spectrometry method, and that'll be the one I just showed you a few minutes ago. None of the other columns in the sample table here are really relevant for today. With this done, I can double check that the LC is hooked up correctly, that I have sufficient gas, and that the samples are in their appropriate spots. I'll also sometimes equilibrate the column now if I haven't used it recently. And now I can go ahead and save the sample table. I'll just call it workshop demo. And then it's ready to go. I can't find the footage where I actually hit start, but I usually just right click the first row in the sample table and then hit Upload con Sample Conditions at the bottom of the right-click menu. After this, if I have no errors, I can press Start and run the sequence. This interesting little bonus clip shows the auto sampler in action. The syringe starts by filling the loop, which it's doing right now. You can then see the needle and mobile sample tray moving in tandem to pick up the sample. The needle will then inject the sample into the loop. The sample is then carried onto the column, and now the syringe is performing its automated wash cycles. This is a view of the OTOF control software during acquisition. You can see the mobilogram on top, the heat map in the middle, and that shows the mobility on the y-axis with M over Z on the x-axis, and intensity is done by the colors. And then beneath that is the spectra, and beneath that is the chromatogram. The reason the mobilogram, heat map, and spectra flash like you can see is that they're in the passive cycle. I don't really have time to go into what passive does, but it's an ion accumulation and fragmentation cycle, and that's actually what generates our MSMS data. Okay, now that we've collected our data, I'm going to quickly go over the data analysis steps for untargeted mass spectrometry. This will be using Metabascape, but these steps are consistent no matter what instrument and what manufacturer of that instrument you use. 
First, raw data is usually centroided to get local maximums for the data range. This makes the data easier to handle and smaller. The next and very important step is peak identification. Here an algorithm goes through all the data to look for chromatogram peaks, also known as features. This can be done with varying levels of stringency to pull out more well-defined peaks or anything that might look like a peak if you aren't being very stringent. Features then between different samples are associated with one another, and if that feature is found enough times between different samples, it is kept as a bucket. Buckets can then be annotated, which is the most challenging part of the process like I was talking about earlier. Any bucket that has been annotated can then, or really any bucket that isn't annotated also, can go through quantification, and then you can eventually output your data into a more useful format to do further statistical or visual analyses. Now I've put this into practice using Metabloscape, which is Bruker's software solution for untargeted metabolomics. First, I can create a new project, which I will call Demo. And then within that project, you can create experiments. I'll also call this one Demo. And then within experiments, you can actually import the raw MS data from the mass spectrometer into what's called a bucket table. To do that, you have to select the polarity that MS data was collected with. In this case, we'll do positive. And then the instrument that the MS data was collected on. We collected this with the TIMS TOF and with TIMS ON, so the algorithm used is T-REX for the. I'll add the MS data now. I've selected this directory, which has the raw positive data in it. And adding that opens up all of the raw data as analyses in this list. Using shift-click, I can highlight each replicate of four and add that to a new sample. The data analysis software treats um, each group of replicates as one sample. So I'll keep doing that, so on and so forth, for each set of six samples. For the blank, I'll only add four, even though there's a few more, so that that will match the rest of the data. Okay, now that I've added seven different samples with four replicates each, I have to define which type of sample each one is. These samples are analytical samples, um, whereas these four are blanks. So I'm leaving the sample type as S for sample on all of these, and this one is being changed to blank. Now I can define groups for all of these samples. So to do that, I'll add one group here, also called demo, and each group needs to have attributes, and as many attributes as you have number of sample types. So in this case we have six, plus a blank. I'll name these according to this file names, so we'll have blank, wl, wgc, I can't remember what the rest are, ML, MGC, and BGC. Okay, now that the groups are defined, I have to add the type of group to each sample. So you can see the sample main, the group name here, demo and then each attribute is listed in this drop-down table. So I'll go BGC, MGC, ML, and so forth for all of these. Okay, I can go next. These are the first of several different parameters that are used in the identification and peak association steps. These two parameters set the minimum number of times a feature must be found in different analyses for that feature to be included in the bucket table. I usually like to set this to about a quarter 
of the number of analyses present. If I increase this, it will be more stringent, picking up better features, but likely less of them. Here we have the processing methods for the identification algorithm. First I'll go into peak processing, that is the T-Rex 4D algorithm. I can edit the algorithm here. I'll switch it to version 1.1 because it has a 30 minute uh, retention time, which is appropriate for the LC we were using. Up here we have peak detection with the intensity threshold and 4D peak size that's related to the trapped ion mobility um, data. And 1,000 and 100 counts are generally appropriate for these settings. Recursive feature extraction here uses a lower number of points to identify peaks that may not have been picked up before with these higher quality settings. Retention time range, as I said, is right here. We also have mass range. 50 to 1500 is very broad, so this should pick up everything, but you could lower it or raise it to be more or less stringent, depending on your tuning settings for the mass spectrometer. We also have the MSMS import parameters here. These are kept on because we need MSMS for annotation later. Next, we'll move on to some of the ion deconvolution settings. These algorithms help identify different ion adducts. Generally, I don't need to change these settings much, since in positive mode, these are the most common ions. The split bucket setting is potentially quite useful. If you suspect you have different isomers that can be separated, leaving this on can help you identify those, especially thanks to the ion mobility system if you have that on. The mass recalibration settings generally don't need to be changed much. These are useful when you have the switching valve running that injects calibrant before each sample run. These don't really need to be changed since it auto detects sodium formate or tune mix within each sample. So I just leave that on. There's no further steps now, so I could hit finish if I wanted this data to run. However, I've already ran it for the demonstration, so I won't, especially because it's also fairly CPU intensive. I'll just hit cancel. That would then populate as a bucket table labeled positive here. I would then need to run a negative bucket table. I would do that by hitting new bucket table within the same experiment and project. Select the correct polarity. Again, select TRX 4D for the TIMS talk with TIMS on. Go next and add this directory. That's the negative directory here, and I can add all of these to the corresponding sample. You'll notice that the sample type and the sample groups are preset since this is in the same experiment. You're not able to change these once you've already set it up and are running another bucket table within the same experiment. So I'll just populate these samples these analyses rather into the sample groups. Okay, that's done, and the groups are correct already, so I can go next. These settings are the same, so I'll just increase that again to about a quarter of the total number of analyses present. And go next, and you'll see all of these algorithms for the peak processing are about the same. T-Rex 4D is the same, just need to make sure I have the right retention time range, so I'll switch to the correct version. And the intensity thresholds and peak points are all the same here, so I'll select that. Ion deconvolution is slightly different since these are negative ions. You'll see we have common negative ions here. But again, I'll leave split buckets on and not change anything here. Mass recalibration is also very similar, just it's looking for uh, negative calibrants to auto detect instead of positive, so I'll leave that on. I could then hit finish if I wanted this run, but again, I've ran this already. I can then I would then have positive and negative bucket tables here. 
could right click both and merge them. And then these merged tables combine both positive and negative into one bucket table to do a data analysis, statistics, annotation, all of that there. You can set tolerance ranges here. I usually leave them pretty low though. You can contest the settings to see how many buckets would be combined, and generally not very many in my experience. Of 8,251 here, only 20 would be merged. Already done that though, so I'll hit cancel. Okay, now the peak identification and processing steps are done, so I can finally open our data as a bucket table. So here's the bucket table. I've already processed this already for the demonstrations, but you can originally see that I have a whole lot of data. There are a grand total of 8,224 buckets, and about yeah, 6,830 of them have MSMS data. If you remember from my earlier explanations, this MSMS data is necessary for peak annotation later on. So these are the data we're really interested in. The next step then is doing that annotation using a spectral library. Importing a spectral library in the tab escape is fairly simple. By selecting this tab and hitting import and picking the right file, it can be done in one step. I've already done that for a whole variety of spectral libraries here, so I can show you what they look like inside. For example, here we have Bruker's Metabobase Personal Library 3. This has 100,000 compounds and over 200,000 spectra, so it's very large. We also have this in silico library from Bruker, which has well over 200,000 compounds. You can see it takes a long time to load since there's so many. There are smaller ones here, for example from Mona, Keg, um, MS Style, um, as well as even smaller ones such as from um, Lloyd Sumner's lab who did a lot of different uh, plant compounds. I will open that one since it's small and easy to look through. Within the library you can see we have a list of compounds with different names. Each named compound has a molecular formula, monoisotopic mass, as well as a variety of other um, data to go along with it. Often you'll have external databases, such as the CAS, Metlin, or KEG databases, and the corresponding IDs for the compound. There's also usually a SMILES or INKEY structure to give you the compound structure. But really the important thing are the spectra contained within each library file. The spectra shown here list the instrument, instrument type, collision energy, polarity it was collected at, as well as the precursor. But really the important thing here is the MSMS. Sometimes there's also a CCS score available. That would be very useful, but it's often not available. These very important MSMS spectra give the fragmentation patterns that occur and become fingerprints for a given compound. So for example, we have these lists of ions, their M over Zs, as well as the relative intensity that occurs. This is saved in the database and then used for annotation later. Now that you've seen these spectral libraries, I can close this one and then go back to the bucket table and perform the annotation. To do that, I just need to hit this tab and go to annotate with spectral library. These are the libraries I have available. I usually just add them all just to get the best chance of getting a hit. If there's a lot of them and you're in a bit of a rush, you can do a hierarchical search, which runs faster with a slight chance of possibly missing some. There are a few settings you can change to get better or worse annotation quality. The narrow settings are the best settings you can have. An M over Z deviation of 2, for example, M sigma of 10, MSMS scores, that's how well the MSMS matches to the spectral library, as well as the CCS percent deviation. Similarly, the wide settings 
are the same, but of course more lenient, so potentially worse quality annotations can make it in. I generally don't mess with the annotation scope or other settings here. I usually am running a complete bucket table and not selected buckets when I'm performing annotation. I've already done this, so I don't need to hit OK. I'll just hit Cancel and show you how many were annotated. You can see of the about 6,000 compounds, or buckets rather, within this table, only about 358 were annotated. And that really speaks to how difficult annotation is with these spectral libraries. Peak annotation is a severe challenge because spectral libraries are incomplete. There's no way for them to capture all of the complex data that can come off of a mass spectrometer and there's no way for researchers to run every single compound on Earth through a mass spectrometer to create a spectral library, especially at different collision energies, um, through different columns, and all that. Once the buckets have been annotated with a spectral library, the next step is often to look through the named compounds and try and find ones that are interesting to your researcher. Often, though, you'll find that the compound is named multiple times. In fact, most of them are named multiple times. The reason these buckets are named multiple times as the same compound is because the same MSMS spectra was found in a spectral library, but at different retention times. You can see here for citric acid, the retention times found were between 0 0.85 and 1.4 minutes but this was found eight times. It's difficult to go through these and say which one is legitimate, particularly if the um, annotation quality scores are the same, such as for these three or four here. The only good way to really determine whether or not these are legitimate peaks is to see if they are found in blanks. If they are, they're likely junk or to look at their extracted ion chromatogram. Unfortunately, the software seems to be a bit buggy right now and I can't generate an extracted ion chromatogram for you, but by comparing the peak to signal noise ratio, you can determine whether or not this named compound is legitimate or whether it's just junk. Another really useful tool within the software are its statistical models. These are helpful for hypothesis generation especially when you have changes in relative abundance between different sample types. And that can inform you that a compound that you weren't necessarily looking for may be biologically active or doing something interesting. The software offers PCA models, PLS, t-tests, and ANOVAs, as well as other clusterings. Um, for this example, I'll just show a PCA model. Bruca recommends a Pareto scaling algori algorithm. I'll leave it at 10% cross-validation and 98 um, explained variance here. Hit OK. And this shows up. Here we have a 3D representation of the PCA scores. Often you'll have to right-click the legend here and go to select groups, and that will let the software know which groups you're using for your samples. So here we can see, for example, the BGC cluster is quite good. The utility of PCA and other statistical models is outside the scope of this demonstration, but as I said, it's really useful for data discovery, hypothesis generation, and that kind of thing, particularly when you're looking for differentially abundant compounds. So I'm going to close this now and go back to the bucket table. My last step here is exporting the data. So I can go to export and export as a CSV. I will add all of the available samples, go next as well as all of the available buckets within those samples. This takes a minute. 
There we go. I can select a file name, add a compound ID if one was available from the spectral library. I prefer CAG here, as well as all of the sample data that is possibly available within this table. I usually just include everything. I've already exported this, so I'm just going to hit cancel. Here's what the bucket table looks like once it's been exported as a CSV. We have the bucket label here, as well as retention time, M over Z, name if it was available, although this did export all 6,000 something MSMS containing buckets. And then importantly here we have the quantifications for the relative amounts detected for each bucket between the different types of samples. So here we have the four replicates for T, four for ML, and so on, and the amounts detected in each one. Once you've exported your data as a CSV, it is potentially useful then for further metabolomic analysis using other sites or other programs besides Metabascape. This will change depending on what you're trying to do, but for example, we like to use MetaboAnalyst. This is a really helpful website that can do visualizations and statistics and that kind of thing, and we'll use our data in this Excel format. Okay, and with that, I'd like to thank you guys for coming to our workshop and watching my video. I'd also like to thank my professor, Dr. Shishu Chen, and my colleagues, Shweda Chajed and Yang Yang Li, who helped a lot with making this video. I'd also like to thank my graduate program, the Plant Molecular and Cellular Biology program, for funding me, as well as UF's ICBR program and the National Science Foundation for helping set this up. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Nai. There are a couple of questions in chat, and uh, I address one about the mass accuracy, as you can see. Within 24 hours, uh, we don't see big difference, and uh, we run, con you know, for each sample, we inject calibrants, as I showed you. So we actually can do post data acquisition calibration in the metabolocscape. So that helps. So the next question is, um, when you measure the, when you use a passive, the eye mobility, and I, can you explain a little bit about yeah. uh, how that works and how does the trap saturation affect yeah. data quality? I realized after making this video that I should have had a slide on it. Um, so I just put one together really quick. Um, so passive is a system that is, you know, patented and made by Bruker. It's parallel accumulation and serial fragmentation. Um, it, it's a synchronization of between the TIMS funnels and the quadrupole. Um, so ions are accumulated in the trapped ion mobility system and then selectively released into the quadrupole. So that lets you fragment many precursor ions more than you would usually get. So about 12 in this case, I think, per um, MS cycle. And then, you know, you go across multiple MS cycles and you get many ions. Yeah. So that, it's just a different type of fragmentation method. Yeah, and usually we don't, we don't, you know, over inject, um, you know, we actually, this instrument, so we actually control the amount of samples we actually put in. The next question is, how does this software deal with peak alignment and how do quality control on this? the peak alignment algorithm in the Pavlovscape. Yeah, so I think um, that's one of the first steps that I showed in that video for Metabloscape. Um, it's an algorithm that you can set. I think you can just set different stringency levels up to you. I'm not really an expert on that, obviously. I mean, I didn't make the software, of course, so I, I can't really say how exactly that algorithm works. Um, you can do QC runs. I didn't do one in that explanation video, but doing that will also help you get, um, you know, I think better peak alignment there as well, probably. I mean, you can use something like, you know, like the internal standard we spike in. Yes, yeah, your internal uh, standard. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Really QC your peak alignment every time and how consistent that is. 
And what are the advantage, uh, advantages, features does the metabolocape over GMPS in terms of metabolic annotation? Annotation? Um, you know, I'm not really sure how well that metabolocape can really, how much more it will do for you. I mean, it, peak annotation will really depend on the data you're feeding into it, I think. So, you know, I, I think other software, I'm not sure how much better it will perform. Of course, Metabloscape has that trapped ion uh, mobility, the CCS data um, built into it already. I think there's not many open source programs right now that can deal with the CCS data. So you're better off with Metabloscape there if you, if you have a system that can generate that. Mm -hmm. Great. Tong has a question about whether it is possible to calculate FDR of the yeah, result. Hmm. I'm sure it is, but I actually have not seen that in Metabloscape. Yeah, I don't know. Any software could give you like, it's, uh, it's different from proteomics where you can randomize your sequence, you know, do a um, decard search with metabolites is pretty hard. I think that's something probably people are still trying to figure out mm -hmm. to see the FDR, you know. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I see there's a few questions above that. Um, mm -hmm. Inside into Metabo Analyst. Um, I think it is, it is good for visualizations and networking. I think there's another question about molecular networking. Um, mm -hmm. But Metabo Analyst is free. I would recommend just make going and trying it out. Um, if you can, if you have your own data, or maybe download some sample data, just to you know give it a try. Um, so I'm trying to catch up on questions. I think that's pretty much all the questions we have.